Hey, Bitch Talk community, this is Erin. This one is for the moms and dads out there who would like a little more calm in their new year. I have this friend, Ed. He's a parent educator who focuses on families with kids with big feelings and challenging behaviors, which, by the way, includes pretty much all toddlers and all teenagers. His parenting counsel is thoughtful and helpful, but he's also fun and irreverent. I promise. He's running a New Year No Yelling Challenge, and he's offering it to the Bitch Talk community for just 10 bucks. You'll get a bite-sized daily lesson, optional group coaching sessions, and access to a virtual community for support. Check it out at villagewellparenting.com and use code BITCHTALK at checkout. Again, villagewellparenting.com, code BITCHTALK, it's one word, and you can start 2024 with more calm and joy in your family life. The link will be in our bio and in our show notes. I'm thinking of making a move up to Northern California. You it's, it's my, I, in my opinion, it's the most beautiful place in North America. Yeah, it's correct. incredible. And please come back on Bitch Talk because we yeah. need five more hours. I would love it. I <laughs> honestly would love it. Let me know whenever. I'm down whenever. Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Aaron, here with my co-host, Ange, a.k.a. Captain Party. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events. Sometimes over a glass of whiskey. But if you're thirsty for more bitches, find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com and follow us on Instagram. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022. And now, on with the show. All right, fasten your seatbelts, everybody, because we are sitting down with the writer and director of probably one of my most favorite films of this year, American Fiction, Cord Jefferson. Thank you for being on Bitch Talk. Thank you so much for having me. So our audience hasn't seen this film as of yet. So can you introduce them to American Fiction? Yeah, it's the story of a black novelist named Monk who gets frustrated at the way that the publishing community pigeonholes black artists and, and sort of like tells black authors that they need to write about, you know, stories of inner cities and slavery and crime and gangs. And he gets frustrated with that and one day decides to write a send up of those kind of novels, imagining that he's going to sort of embarrass everybody and shame the publishers for publishing the stuff that they that they publish. And instead, the, the book becomes a massive bestseller. And there's a you know, that's reductive, but that's sort of like the main thrust of the film. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on. But you have to have the like short the synopsis. Thing. Yeah, exactly. For the people. That's the elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This film is based on a book called Erasure. Mm -hmm. How did that come into your life? And beyond writing a film off of it, what was the impact on your life from this book? So I was reading, I actually, in December of 2020, I was reading a review for a different book called Interior Chinatown. And the review said that the satire of the of Interior Chinatown was re reminiscent of Percival Everett's Erasure. And I had never heard of Erasure. So I went out and bought it and read it over Christmas break and was immediately... I don't know if you guys, have you guys ever read a book that felt like it was written specifically for you? Like that's, yes. that's how it felt when I was reading this book. It felt like somebody sat down to write Cord Jefferson novel. Mm -hmm. And there was just, because there's sort of like these kinds of themes of like feeling like you're being pigeonholed and sort of the expectations. I mean, you know, I think that it's something that we all encounter eventually. I think particularly, it's particularly acute for people of color and women and queer people. But I think sort of like everybody encounters this idea that we're all unique individuals with our own passions and ideas, but, you know, the world tries to sand down those edges in order to sort of make us more accessible for them. And, you know, that is a conversation that I've been having with so many of my friends for literally decades. But then on top of that, there was, you know, there's a sibling story and I have two older siblings and sort of, you know, we've had a push and pull in our relationship over the years. And, you know, we, there's an overbearing father character and, we, you know, I've had both my brothers and I sort of like have our own issues with our dad and there's an ailing mother figure and sort of I had take I had moved home to take care of my ailing mother in 2016 who was she was dying of cancer. And so there's just all these overlaps with my life. And it just felt like when something would sort of resonates with you that deeply, I just feel like. To me, the metric of something that I like is how frequently I think about it after I've consumed it. So it's like if I'm still thinking about a movie like three weeks later, I think that that's the sort of that suggests quality to me. And so it was just a book that as soon as I was as soon as I was reading it, I was like, I couldn't stop thinking about it when I'd put it down. I need to go back and read it more. And it just felt like, you know, what all great art and sort of like to me, what subjective, what's great art. But I just think that for me, there's a James Baldwin quote that I'm going to butcher, but it's essentially like. 
everybody thinks that, you know, your pain and sorrow and anger are sort of like unique unto you. But then you open books and you start to read and you realize that you're not alone. And sort of like that, that sort of, it opens up the world to you and you realize that actually there's a lot of other people out there who feel the way that you feel. Or sometimes even one person, like that just, that, that can even make you feel less alone, right? Like if you find the right book and it sort of taps into something that you've been feeling, like you're the only person in the world who feels this, there's something special about that. And there's really something that feels really nice about that. And so I think that that is what the, that's the impact that it had on my life besides just making this movie is just, I think the sort of like best art makes you feel less alone. And so when I read this, I just immediately felt like, oh, this is somebody who, because the book was also published more than 20 years before I'd, that's not true. It was, but it, but it was 19 years before I'd ever found it, it was published. And I was like, wow, this is somebody who was thinking about the exact same things I'm thinking about two decades ago, you know? And that to me was was sort of one of the most beautiful parts of the creative process with it was just feeling less alone. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I feel like we're at a TED Talk right now. <laughs> I'm just like feeling the, the emotions. And this movie has, like you said, stayed with me ever since we watched it. Oh, I have to thank great. you so much. Thank you. And, but I really think it's important for the audience to know all these topics that you touch on, race relations, aging parents, sibling relationships, the complications of that. This is also a hilarious movie. Thank like, you. We were laughing out <laughs> loud. You. There are so many one-liners that thank come out you. of nowhere. Thank and you. it really needs that to thank just you. sort of give that balance. Yeah. Yeah, I don't ever, I never wanted to make something that felt like life is neither comedy nor drama. You know, it's a sort of like, even in the worst moments of my life, I've found ways to laugh and like have joy. And I think that I never wanted to make something, I never wanted to make something that felt like super gloomy and depressing. You know, I think that the world is gloomy and depressing enough these days. It's sort of, I think that I like to go to movies to laugh and have fun and sort of like talk about with my friends after and go to dinner and sort of chat about. And that that to me is sort of what I wanted to accomplish with the film. And also, you know, the same way that, though that I did, I didn't want the movie to feel like farcical and, and slapsticky. And so I did sort of like hope that there were those moments of with the family that kind of grounded things a little bit. So it didn't sort of like crumple under the weight of, of the comedy. But yeah, I, I sort of, this is a movie that is made like I literally made it for people to go see in theaters with their friends and their family and strangers and sort of like laugh and leave with a smile on their face and then go talk about it like dinner or a bar afterward. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. I think that and I think that that is that to me is like sort of I think that there's there's a weird thing about that. Like I love the Nicole Kidman ad as much as everybody else before the AOC. <laughs> like it's like, don't get me wrong. Like I, I sort of I love that thing. But I think that sort of like the main problem with that with that scenario is that she's in an empty theater when she's saying that and sort of like we should consider movies like live music you know it's like it's like you can sit at home and play a record if you want to and it's going to sound good and you probably you can have a great stereo system but there's something about being in a room with a bunch of people and experiencing this this music together and i think that that's what, how we need to start thinking of the theater experience is like it's it's like live music and so this is a movie that's really made to be enjoyed around a bunch of people so i hope people go with their friends and sort of talk about it afterward that's my hope and dream Speaking of music, thank you for the segue. Yeah. Uh, little did you know, your composer's a woman, Laura Katman. Of course, Cartman. you had. I'm sorry, no Katman. No. You had to have gorgeous music throughout this film and gorgeous jazz music. So, can yeah. you talk about that? And and were you working with her? Did she do this all on her own? So, I knew as soon as I started that I wanted jazz to be the score. And so, met with Laura, who has a background in piano, but sort of like in everything, really. She's just sort of like a, a musical encyclopedia. And she came in with just so many great musical ideas from our very first meeting that once we started working together, it was like very collaborative. I know nothing about music. I'll say that. I know what I like, but, but sort of like as far as musical composition or anything, I know nothing about that. And so that's one of the things that I really liked about making the movie was that you can just sort of work with somebody and just be very you can be incredibly collaborative with people and say like, you know what, I don't know why, but this just doesn't feel right. Like that's the greatest thing about music is that it is this kind of like universal language because it is so much of it, so much of it is just about emotion, like how something feels. And so I didn't need to know the vocabulary necessarily to say like, that's an F flat. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I like that. It was more just like, you know, I don't think, I think this sort of like the mood here is a little bit different. Or I think that this is like a little too treacly sounding and sort of like, maybe we draw back on that a little bit. And it was this incredible collaborative process. And she was amazing because she was 
totally willing to sort of collaborate in sort of like a very natural way, but also she was also really welcoming when I, you know, when I was open about the fact that I didn't know stuff because I had never directed a movie before. I'd never written a movie before. And so it felt like she was very gentle with me when I sort of came in and said clearly, like, I don't know what I'm doing necessarily, but I really do want to work with you and make this as good as possible. It's so good. All, all so three much. of us were like that Thank music. So Dancing, much. grooving from the right? beginning. Thank yeah. you so much. I, and yeah. I think that like America, I think that jazz is such a, people call it American classical music. It is such this like, to me, I was raised in a jazz household. My dad played tons of jazz when I was, he still does play a ton of jazz. So it's this American art form that I, that I worry is like falling off, unfortunately, and sort of not, not doesn't have the audience that it used to here in the States. And so I still love it, though, and I, th- I still sort of wanted to make sure that it was part of the film, despite the fact that, you know, it's not as cool as it once was, unfortunately, but I love it. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of the film and one of the most realistic parts, I think, are the strong women characters who just (laughs) really ground the story and bring a lot of heart to it, specifically Lorraine, Coraline and Lisa. Absolutely. So can you talk about how you wrote these women characters and how you made them so impactful, regardless of how much time they spent on screen or not? Yeah, absolutely. I think that for me, well, let me just sort of like do a lot of therapy talk right now. I think that I've struggled a lot in my life with sort of like the lessons of like, I hate to use this term, but I'll just use it because it's the easiest shorthand, toxic masculinity. I just think it's sort of like, if you're a young man raised in the United States of America, especially sort of like at a certain time and sort of like getting all these lessons by proxy and also lessons that you might get at home, you sort of like grow up with a certain understanding about how how to be a man in the world. And I certainly grew up with those lessons. And I, for a long time, spent a lot of my life closed off from the world and kind of angry. And I would hide myself. And I sort of like, I had this great therapist one day who told me that anger is actually not a real emotion. She said, like, it's a secondary emotion. And actually, underneath anger always, particularly for men, is fear or pain. And that's sort of like the way that men learn that they can express those emotions is through anger and rage. And it's because it's sort of like, as a man, you're not really allowed to say like, you hurt my feelings, despite the fact that that's what you're feeling is like, you hurt me. And so instead you sort of like rage and yell and rant. And so this movie is populated with male characters, particularly Monk, but also, you know, and also Cliff who, who kind of, they're running away from their feelings and they're hiding them and they're lying to everybody. And they've sort of like isolated themselves because They're so unwilling to sort of tell people, like, you hurt me, or sort of like, I feel scared, or I feel lonely. And in my life, and certainly sort of like in other people's lives, the people who don't do that, and the people who sort of like are willing to stick with me, and the people who are willing to sort of teach me were women, you know? And I think that sort of unfortunately, these sort of responsibilities, maybe not even responsibilities, but women, it's not, they're not responsible for doing it, but women frequently take it upon themselves to deal with men who are like this and sort of like teach them why they're, and maybe if they don't even teach them why they're reacting this way, they tolerate them behaving this way, you know, until they're sort of like able to find, able to find for themselves why they are behaving the way they are. So I think that a perfect example of this is, not to give anything away, but in that opening scene with Monk and Lisa, his sister, like you have sort of like Monk, who's just this sort of like closed off, isolated person who's refusing to sort of engage with his sister. And she takes it upon herself to kind of break the ice and is like, okay, I see how this is going to be if I don't, if I don't take it upon myself to sort of like talk to him and try to initiate a relationship, like he's never going to meet me halfway. So I need to be the one who goes out, goes out of my way and does this, you know, and you see this with Coraline, you see this with Agnes, you know, there's just a lot of, I sort of felt that it was realistic and sort of like actually realistic in my life that there are these men who are just unwilling to connect with their feelings. And so they've surrounded themselves with women who are connecting with their feelings and are trying to sort of like help convince them to come out of their shells a little bit. And so that to me was incredibly important and also incredibly authentic to to my life and sort of a, I think life in general. I do think that that, that is a, I don't think that's a unique story unto me, I'll say. I know we have to wrap. I have one last question for you. Please. So you're in San Francisco for the Mill Valley Film Festival, but are you going to be writing an Eater piece? I just did. Yeah. About San Francisco? Oh, wait, no, no. Oh, I saw the, I read did the Vegas read, one this did morning. Did you read the Vegas one this morning? Wow, you're a quick reader. I, a little, I, I, I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. I'm halfway through. It just it's, came out. Okay, I was going to say. It's really funny. <laughs> no, are you. you writing one about San Francisco? I wish. I will. I was just saying, like, I 
love this city. Thank you. I we do too. If I could, if I could, <laughs> if I could do my job in Northern California, I think I would. And I and I promise you, like, I'm thinking of making a move up to Northern California. You it's it's my I, in my opinion, it's the most beautiful place in North America. Yeah, it's correct. Incredible. And please come back on Bitch Talk because we yeah. need five more hours. I would love it. I <laughs> honestly would love it. Let me know whenever. I'm down whenever. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. We've been speaking with Core Jefferson. Go see American Fiction. It's Bitch Talk approved. One of the best films of the year. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.